So the video you're about to see is just a little bit of a rant that I'm going on here as my studies have taken me down this rabbit hole of Springfield Armory trapdoor rifles. Now I just want to point out that the study of trapdoor rifles is not very difficult when compared to some civilian guns, say Colt or Smith & Wesson, because it's all there in black and white with records kept by the United States military. And there's not a lot of people, say like R.L. Wilson, who have muddied the waters of Colt. There are not a lot of people like that out there in the Springfield world. The trapdoor world is fairly easy to study and straightforward. And the answers to the questions that are posed in this video, the myths, shall we say, are all very easily found with just a handful of books. Furthermore, I want to say that not all YouTube channels continuously perpetuate these myths. Only the really big ones that I have seen here lately. And so, channels like Seer Trip, excellent channel. Great trapdoor stuff on there. And several of the other smaller channels that really do know what they're talking about. And I also include Hickok45, because he really does know what he's talking about when it comes to most of his trapdoor stuff. Most of the other big channels that I'm referring to here don't have a clue what they're talking about when they make these videos. So this is just a little bit of a rant video. I hope you enjoy it. Hello everybody, this is Garrett from 11 Bang Bang and just got done reading this pamphlet, The Trapdoor Springfield and the Service by Colonel Philip M. Shockley. This is not a book I would suggest if you're looking for correct information on a trapdoor rifle. This is a book that was written in 1958 and is one of the reasons why you have to be careful with some of these uh, smaller publications uh, pre-internet age, shall we say. Well, let me start by just reading you what he wrote right here in the introduction. He said, The majority of my opinions and many of the accounts contained in this article are based upon unpublished manuscript material found in records pertaining to long-abandoned frontier posts, letter books, Order books and general post records yielded much information, as did hospital records, regimental histories. Another source was from notes taken by me years ago following interviews with veteran soldiers, many of whom participated in the campaigns, battle, and peacetime employments mentioned in this work, Colonel Philip M. Shockley. And as you will note there, he did not claim one source that could be followed. And I really discovered that since this was a popular little book, a lot of myths about the trapdoor probably stem from this very little pamphlet. Anyway, so I went around looking on the internet at some other videos. I've been studying this subject for about six months now. I have quite a few books. I'll leave a link to all my sources down here in the description of this video. So, as I went along and I watched all these other big YouTube channels, some of them with hundreds of thousands of views, all doing their reviews of the trapdoor rifle I realized one thing in common was that they all quoted the Wikipedia page which is also incorrect so without further ado let's talk about the six major myths that I have discovered involving the Springfield trapdoor rifle so we are going to start with myth number six and work our way down to the most egregious myth which is number one Myth number six, the trapdoor rifle was adopted so that soldiers would not shoot so much ammunition and the government would not waste so much money. The reason I include this is because half of it is true and half of it is false. If you look in the tests and the studies and you look for the reports and through the letters, you won't find a place where any government official actually says soldiers are just going to shoot up all their ammunition and it's going to cost us too much. There is some worry, yes, about shooting up ammunition and running out in the middle of a battle, but it's not really addressed as such. Main argument people have here is that they should have adopted the Winchester 73. Well, <laughs> in any of these trials, all the way up into the 73 trapdoor, which there are way more trials and way more trapdoors than just the 73, you would have to realize that all the way up to the 73, Winchester had not even turned out a center fire rifle. Yes, one of the Springfield trapdoors was adopted in 1873, 
And yes, Winchester did turn out an 1873 rifle, but you have to remember, Winchester barely turned out 126 1873 rifles in the year of 1873, and none of them actually hit the market before the early May adoption of the 1873 Springfield. So you would have been dealing specifically with rim fires had you adopted a Winchester repeating rifle at the time, and rim fires is something they were trying to get away from. Not only that, but the Winchester had its own issues, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. So what part of this myth is true? Well, the part about saving money. You have to remember that when this adoption was going on over a period of about eight years, the United States government was in a slump. We had just fought a massive civil war uh, that had cost a lot of money, and they literally had one million muskets sitting on the shelves that could be converted. Now, I'm not even talking about 73. I'm talking about before, from 65 to 70. They had one million muskets that could be converted. They had no money. As a matter of fact, there were years going forward into the 1870s when the Springfield Armory received zero funds for a whole year, zero, and were forced to work on previous years allotted finances. And you might say, well, why didn't the government finance firearms? The government couldn't finance the firearms. They had no money. What do you think that Black Hills campaign in 1876 and Custer and Little Bighorn was all about? It wasn't about the land. It was about gold. They needed the gold that was in the Black Hills because the country was going under financially, so they could not afford to adopt another rifle, especially an expensive repeater. <laughs> Myth number five. Now, it has often been stated on many of these big YouTube channels that the Springfield Trapdoor is the number one and sole reason that Custer lost the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Nope, not even close. A lot of people will flat out tell you had they had Winchesters, they would have won that fight. I can tell you from studying the battle itself, I've done a lot of work with Duke Frazier Productions who has extremely long videos. You know, he's been studying this fight for years and I've done a lot of work with him and go check his channel out. But if you look at it, Maybe some Arenos guys would have gotten a little bit better into the stick, but Custer completely charged into the center of the village and was immediately met by thousands of warriors and immediately charged right back up the hill with the warriors already mounted and on his heels. At no point could long range have helped them. They literally got up the hill, dismounted, and went into battle formation. And yes, some of their guns jammed as the natives rode on, around, and through them. But... The fact of the matter is, if they would have had 1903 Springfields, they wouldn't have fared any better, in my opinion, because the range wouldn't have helped them, with some people claiming as many as 2,000 warriors. Granted, some of them were fighting Reno across the way, but some people claim there were as many as 10,000 there, and that's the natives that claim that. He would have had to make literally every shot count because he only had a little over 200 men there with him. And when you're facing 2,000 warriors... You're not going to win that engagement. Maybe if they'd had Winchesters with a few more rounds of ammunition, they'd have took a few more with them. But overall, because of bad leadership there and bad planning and bad strategy, they would all still be just as dead. Myth number four. The trap door was obsolete the day it was adopted. <laughs> I see this all the time on the gun channels and... What they don't realize is the trapdoor wasn't actually adopted in 73. It was actually adopted in 66, and some were even made in 65 of a different variety. So let's go back to the adoption of 66. What were the British using at the time? I believe it was the Snyder single shot, basically a trapdoor rifle. What were the Spanish using at the time? Well, they would actually very soon be using a single shot Remington rolling block rifle. What were the French and the Prussians using at the time? Single shot rifles were the weapon of choice for the entire world at that point, except for a few Native Americans and some other people that the government was fighting who might be using rimfire rifles. Now, as I've said before, why did they not adopt the Winchester, even though it had had two iterations out already, the 60 Henry, I guess you would call it a Winchester, and the 66 Winchester? Both of those were in rimfire, and by the way, 
when the adoption took place in 66, the 66 Winchester was still just barely a, a blip on the radar. It hadn't, as far as I know, I don't even think they had turned one out yet. So let's talk about when the adoption of the 73 came along. The proprietary rifle all around the world is still going to be a single shot. You have to remember, the whole year of 1873, Winchester only put out 126 rifles. They were nowhere near ready for production. And there's still this thing called uh, licensing that the government would have had to pay to Winchester, Remington, any of these other places if they wanted to use their guns. Believe me, if you do the study, lawsuits on patent infringements against the government were a huge deal in the 1870s. It was not obsolete the day it was adopted in 66. It was not obsolete when the major adoption happened in 1873. What about later? Well, yes, other countries did move on to bolt-action rifles, but not in the numbers you would think. And there were always experimentation going on with these other nations, and they went through gun after gun after gun after gun. In reality, the United States knew they weren't facing anything they couldn't handle with a single-shot rifle. Outside of that one instance of the rifle failing them at the Battle of Little Bighorn, all the other conflicts, they seemed to get along all right. Military doctrine was based around a single shot rifle all the way up into the 1890s and beyond. Remember, it's very rare that military doctrine actually focuses on the gun and is much more common for the gun to focus on the military doctrine of the time. Myth number three that I see on these big YouTube channels all the time. We're getting down to some of the good ones. The 73 Springfield does not kick. When I hear these statements being made on these bigger YouTube channels, I know for a fact it's because they are going to be shooting Black Hills smokeless cowboy load ammunition, and it never fails. I've never seen a big YouTube channel with the exception of Hickok45, who, as I've said before, does extremely well on his trapdoor history, that shoots the Black Powder 4570s. They automatically assume that Black Powder is weaker than the cowboy loads that they're using, and that is just not true. Those cowboy loads do not produce any recoil because, A, number one, they're severely underloaded so that they can be shot in original trapdoors, and number two, they're not even using the correct bullet. Original trapdoors have a bore that is slightly larger than modern 4570s. Your lever actions or anything that you're going to buy from the store today is going to have a few thousandths of an inch smaller bullet, and it's not even going to engage the rifling correctly. Now, like I said, the 4570 does not kick you as hard as some people think, but that is when you are using the original 405 grain bullet and 70 grains of black powder. It'll move you a little bit. It's very accurate. It's a good round. But when you get into the 1880s and they start using the 500 grain bullet and 70 grains of powder, that's when you're talking about a little bit stouter recoil. That round will move you around a little bit, and it's very accurate. There were marksmen that the United States military loaded up in the 1880s some cartridges for, and those marksman cartridges were 500 grain bullets with 80 grains of black powder in a 4570 case. So that is very compressed. That right there is hitting buffalo rifle territory, true buffalo rifle territory. You're getting up there to the 5090, the 45, 110, that kind of area. You're getting up there when you start using that bullet and that powder combination. And yes, those guns kick significantly. Anybody who's about to tell you that A, their gun is not accurate, and B, it has no recoil and is not as powerful as they thought it would be, is more than likely about to shoot some Black Hills ammunition in their video. Just bet on it. Myth number two. This is one that one particular channel is kind of spreading around there. The trapdoor rifle did not serve long because it was a poor design. So let's think about this a little bit. The first trapdoor was officially adopted and put into military use in 1866. It was made in 1865, so, and it's called the Model 1865, so let's just go with 1865. 75, 85, officially not used in 93. Officially they quit making them, but it still goes on to be used in the Spanish-American War and still is in United States National Guard units up there in 1905. So let's count this again. 75, 85, 95, 1905. 40 years of consecutive service and some even beyond. They really don't get rid of them until 1916. They really start shoving them out on the market through the civilian marksmanship program. 40 years 
So, maybe the second longest serving, maybe the first. I don't know. You guys know more about those AR-15s and modern military rifles than I do. Let me know in the comments, but I can tell you one thing. Even with just the 73, that thing would have been 83, 93, 1903. That, even that thing would have been 30 years in service at least. All right, myth number one, my all-time favorite right here. The 1873 trapdoor was the first adopted rifle with a self-contained center fire cartridge. You will hear that on every channel. Every one of the big ones anyway that don't know what they're talking about. This was not, I repeat, not the first adopted across the entire military center fire cartridge. That would be the 5070 in the 1866 rifle. Adopted completely all the way across the military. 57,000 rifles made at a time when the United States military didn't have near that many people in it. And then after that, the 68 would be adopted with around 60,000 units made all the way across the entire military units. And then after that, the 1870 and 5070 would be adopted with around 12,000 made all the way across the United States military. And the Springfield rolling block. Notice I didn't say Remington. The Springfield made rolling block would be adopted with a couple thousand being made, at least 10,000. Go over and check out by land and sea. I'll link to his channel in the description below this video. Where, you know, at least 10,000 of those before he even thought about using the 4570 again. The 1873 is technically the fifth adoption across the entire military to use a center fire cartridge. And I just, it gripes me to no end when I see somebody say that. And I automatically know what their level of study on the subject is because they are literally quoting the Wikipedia page front to back because the Wikipedia page is also wrong on that particular subject. So there you guys go. Six myths about the trapdoor that I hope that I have helped bust today. As always, trust in God. Keep your powder dry. Bye.